yesterday, sure. Are these on? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay. Uh, I really have so many questions. This is a fantastic film. Um, so much to unpack about this film. Uh, but I, I think I'd like to start by, again, how did you come to the project? What was the, how did the relationship with LeBron start or mature during all of this? Um, I think people would like to know that, so I'll just leave it with that. Um, well, the foundation um, and um, a number of the other executive producers were looking, you know, for a filmmaker. Uh, so I was one that they interviewed. Um, I had done a film, I think, two years earlier called Class Divide. Yes. Which was uh, looking at a change in the Chelsea neighborhood uh, that I lived in and that my studio was in um, uh, through the eyes of kids, uh, two sides of the street. On one side of the street uh, was the newest exclusive private school in Manhattan called the Avenues of the World School. Some of the wealthiest families' kids were there. And on the other side of the street uh, was a public housing project. Um, and that film, I think, touched the executives, uh, LeBron, his foundation, uh, and they asked if I would be interested in this project. And uh, I, you know, I have to admit, when I, I first met LeBron, I did confess I'm a basketball, you know, yeah. big basketball fan. Uh, but I said, LeBron, I'm going to be honest with you, I've always rooted for the other team. Uh, <laughs> I am a Nick fan. Uh, and, uh, but um, I said, you know, this is uh, such a moving enterprise. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm now part of the family. So that's how, that's how it all started. Mm -hmm. Your access to the students, uh, teachers, the families at home was remarkable. How does that happen? It's very hard to get to that level. Well, that was part of the initial discussion was um, obviously they were interviewing me and talking to me and looking at my work. But the other side of it was I said, uh, are you willing to show the good, the bad, the ugly? Uh, are you willing uh, to uh, allow us this access, which you saw obviously at times kids acting out, the, the, the baggage they bring, to school, these were the most at-risk kids. Um, and to Michelle's credit, to LeBron's credit, uh, and to the, the school board's credit even, because I had to sit down with, this was a public school, I mean, I just want to uh, say that um, as the project we were discussing, the ground rules, uh, they made it clear to me that most people had said, set up your own academy, LeBron, that way you can control it. You know, the board can't tell you what to do. Uh, and he said, no. Uh, and then they said, well, let's make it a charter school because we'll have a little more freedom from the, the school board, the unions, every, everybody that has a say in public education. He said, no. He said, I went to a, a public elementary school, as you heard at one point, he missed 80 days. Um, and I wanted to be an elementary, a public elementary school. So you, get, you have to get the buy-in <coughs> from the teachers. So it started with uh, meeting <coughs> teachers uh, before the school year started. Uh, you had to get the buy-in from the parents. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you had to get the buy-in from Michelle, who really uh, who runs the Bronx Foundation and is an amazing woman, a superwoman. Um, and my thing was, look, you know, you could do kind of a, a feel-good film about what a great idea this is, but if people don't see the real challenges, they don't see uh, really what you're up against, the victories aren't going to amount to much. And uh, what was interesting is it was the teachers that really signed on big time and became advocates because they were like, <clears throat> people don't know what we do every day. In fact, <laughs> The first day of shooting, uh, the first day of school, I remember uh, the crew came back uh, to the hotel and we all said, let's wash up and we'll meet for dinner and discuss, you know, how it went, what we're going to do uh, day two. Uh, nobody showed up for dinner. We all collapsed. Uh, 
and at breakfast the next morning, we all looked at each other and was like, these teachers do this every day. <laughs> uh, so they, that was huge. They wanted people to understand uh, what it takes. And I have to admit, I've got two uh, uh, teachers in my family, my two sisters, uh, and my mother was a, a professor. Um, but it certainly raised my awareness of uh, how much teachers give and what they're up against. And if you just look at what's happening now, um, there's a teacher shortage. Yeah. You know, obviously COVID added to the crisis, but uh, we don't respect them, we don't pay them enough, we don't give them enough support in our culture. And uh, we're seeing the result of that right now. I, yeah. I also want to just focus on, for a moment, on the, the sort of two tracks. One is academic achievement, and one is social and emotional learning. We are in a period right now, particularly in Florida, as a sort of the, the leading edge of corrosiveness, where social and emotional learning is being gutted as being like we don't need that. That's not our goal in public education. But watching your film, it is clear that if that wasn't present, achievement would be hard to achieve. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, you know, I just read about that, that, <coughs> that um, social emotional learning being attacked as not a relevant but socialist or right. anti-American right. or uh, it's madness. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, living that year uh, at the Ivy Brown School, you see how essential it is, this idea of trying to understand your own emotions, becoming aware of how you feel, uh, how you act out. No, it's just frightening, and uh, I'm glad you brought that up, that uh, DeSantis and others are, have somehow targeted this uh, as, as something else that uh, so-called progressives, leftists, whatever, uh, are, are, are using to somehow corrupt the, the education system. When as you can see here, um, it's really an, an indispensable element and it's what this school in many ways, that and the wraparound, the idea that the whole family and ultimately the whole community has to be involved in the educational process, in the public educational process. And uh, in many ways since we uh, made this film four years ago, uh, public education has become the front line in many, many ways in terms of the culture war, the political battles that we are fighting right now. It is really on that level that you see it, and it's scary. Yeah. Before I go to the audience, you just mentioned that the year in Akron, how, were you in Akron, you were embedded in Akron for that year? Well, yes. Um, we kind of worked out a schedule where we would be there, uh, you know, five, six days a month. You know, uh, so at the same time, I, I had a team uh, that if I couldn't be there, uh, others could be. Uh, but that was kind of the game plan. Obviously, in the beginning, the first few months, uh, we were there intensively. Um, but yeah, I was, I was there from the beginning to the end. Yeah, the continuity is so clear in this movie. As you go month to month, the chronology, um, it, it just struck me that there were really uh, more than just incremental, significant changes that were going on month to month with, with the kids that you focused on. I'm glad you captured all of that. Let's go to the audience. I'm sure someone has questions for Mark. Yes, go ahead. Mark, uh, oh, I like the mic. Uh, you mentioned that uh, This model obviously has proven successful given what we've seen in your film. But I'm curious how, what's the term? Du uh, the only term that I can think of is duplicatable. How can this be duplicated uh, with the intense, the, the perfect, it seemed to be a perfect student to teacher ratio. Uh, it seemed that there was so much time and effort spent on an individual basis, is this at all possible to do nationally on a, on a public school level? I think that's a, a, a big question, certainly one I had, uh, I guess you could call it the scaling question and the sustainability question. And I think that's uh, unclear now. I mean, given that there's a teacher shortage, we can't even hire enough, you know, or, or there are not enough people that want to go into teaching. Uh, so it's, it's a big question, and then of course 
not every community has a superstar of the status and means of LeBron James. At the same time, uh, if we as a culture shift our perspective and, and see the value, the long-term value of investing in our youth. Uh, Lloyd really brought this up uh, when we spoke before of the festival uh, about the connection between the film we showed yesterday, Slam, uh, and this film. Uh, and although they're separated by, you know, 20 some years, this idea of the school to prison pipeline that so many of these kids can be identified literally in third grade um, that we know where they might end up. And given all the costs, law enforcement, mental health, uh, the, the so-called uh, prison industrial system, all that, uh, it's a tremendous waste. You see the potential. You see the tremendous potential, but it requires a, a dramatic shift. We can't even get a child tax credit. I mean, there are things going forward, but even the idea of, of helping working families uh, that are trying to raise their kids. Uh, for some of these teachers, one of the things that, you know, I had never really thought about, but I saw was they gave so much, and that's where the sustainability, you know, so much emotion, uh, so much compassion, they had nothing left for their own families. Uh, they were burnt out. And it, it, it's, a, it's a real question, but I think it requires a larger cultural shift. Uh, and other societies have obviously made it where teaching is uh, highly respected, it's, it's highly paid, and they see the payoff in investing in their kids starting at such a young age. But I think it's an unanswered question that you asked. Yes. Up top, yeah, right there, Frank. Hi. Um, first, just uh, as a testament to the power of this uh, film that you made, I think we're conversing about the subject and the issues um, more so than the technical aspects of the film. And just, I'm going to carry that along. Um, so I just wanted to make uh, a comment and then ask a question. One comment is um, uh, focus on uh, even preschool and infancy and mothers and, and, and infants is a big issue in, in my profession, pediatrics. And uh, so if you start the trajectory even earlier because we know that language development uh, is really a, a thing that starts with birth and is really pretty well established by age two, two to three. And uh, kids who live in poverty are way, way behind on their, uh, on their number of words they say. Development of the language. So uh, that's just a comment. And I guess the, the question is um, in, in LeBron's school, uh, to what it, it, you sort of referred to it, but to what extent was there um, behavioral health services connected to the families and social services that extended to the, to the families? You alluded to it. I'd just like to hear a little bit more about his model in terms of that aspect. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a unique aspect. Um, there are all sorts of services uh, available for family members, including psychological, mental health, uh, that you would find you know, in a normal public school. Uh, at the end, you see in the final credits. I mean, they are so ambitious, and you know, you'll know, have to see how it all works out, but this idea of getting into housing, providing housing, families. Uh, this idea of building a community center uh, that, that will be like a cultural center. Uh, it's an incredibly ambitious, uh, that, that this, this woman, Michelle, who runs this foundation, it's unbelievable what she's taken on. Uh, so we'll have to see. But like you said, early childhood education, uh, you know, it's, it's a key. Uh, and hopefully this battle that Lloyd has, has just pointed out that, you know, somehow this has now become political. Uh, hopefully we will prevail and uh, things will move in the right direction come November. It's certainly more hopeful now than uh, probably was a month ago. Questions? Tell them. Um, getting to your point as a pediatrician, there is a national organization called Reach Out and Read which has state affiliates 
in all of the states and Puerto Rico and Guam as well. And it's a birth to age six, well child visit um, affiliation with pediatricians and family practice doctors that gives age appropriate, developmentally appropriate books to children at each well child visit with the idea that children who are read to get all of that vocabulary before they start school because by the you learn to read by the time you're in fifth grade and or third grade, and by third grade you are reading to learn. And I was wondering why they chose to start at third grade rather than perhaps a year or two before, so that they could get them to a, a, a more advanced level of being able to be successful in other grades. I, I think I, I had the same question, uh, and I think uh, looking into the future in terms of other people. Uh, you know, tr trying to come up with their own model, that is a necessary step. For them, there's a test that second graders take in the state of Ohio, it's mandated. Uh, so that's how they got their pool. In other words, this was, a, you got chosen by lottery, uh, but to be in the pool, you had to test in the bottom 25% of that second grade test. That's the test that, that uh, many use as a predictor of who's going to drop out of high school, who's going to get in trouble on the street, etc. So they, that, that was how they explained it, was that gave them the pool to do the lottery. But I, I think there's no doubt that as others try experiments and pilot programs, the earlier you start, the more uh, you're going to see a real difference. Let's take one. Is there anybody in the balcony? Because I don't want to ignore anybody. Nobody has a question up there? Oh, 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 uh, no. I can't see. Yes? No? Yes. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Through the balcony, go ahead. We're going to pass yeah, your <laughs> Thanks, Mark, for the shout out to teachers. I'm a former teacher. My wife is a teacher in Millbury. Um, I think that's an unexplored part of the story, and I wondered if you ever thought of following the teachers as well uh, for home visits. Could you saw a piece of that in an early, I think it's a faculty meeting, um, where, you know, where the staff is just in tears. Uh, and I wonder if that was ever uh, thought of. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, something I look forward in the future. Um, there's only so much we can get in, obviously, you know, trying to, as Lloyd said at the beginning, uh, give you a, a different perspective on eight, nine-year-olds and, and the four characters we follow. And just give you a little status report on where they are because, you know, like the film is a roller coaster, obviously, of ups and downs. Uh, and uh, that continues. The school now is uh, going to, has started in August. Uh, this is for many schools, I, I think probably including here the first sense of maybe returning to some semi-normal, you know, after COVID, obviously. Uh, and so this, uh, Vince and his classmates will be going into eighth grade. That'll be the last year uh, of the I Promise School. So now it is a full school. Uh, Vince, as, as uh, I spoke to Angel yesterday, uh, who's going through her own, you know, uh, personal dramas, uh, she said, Vince is Vince. He's still class clown, uh, doing much better academically, uh, but, you know, and, and still devoted to his horror film fanaticism. Halloween every day. Uh, uh, Scout is uh, one of the top scholars in the school. I mean, to me, even watching it now, the moment where she reads aloud in school, uh, you know, don't think of somebody reading for 20 or 30 seconds in school as a climax in, in, <laughs> in, in, in a movie. But in many ways, it, it was. You know, for her, you know, as you saw earlier, be reluctant to read, hating reading, to, to all of a sudden be reading, to be going up four or five levels. She's now at the top of her class. Deshana, unfortunately, left the school last year. Uh, her father, uh, felt that uh, he wanted her to go to uh, a school closer to where he lived and he wanted to be more involved in her life so she's no longer part of the I Promise School. Uh, and finally, Nate uh, is in the school, 
he's doing good, but he did have a run-in, another run-in. Uh, he and another buddy brought in uh, two toy guns. Uh, but uh, at first nobody knew exactly what was going on and uh, he was uh, suspended again uh, and, uh, but has returned, is doing well. Uh, and his family is now actually living in some of the community housing that uh, the foundation has put together. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a life struggle. Uh, this is a, a drama, I, I tell you secretly, uh, I would like to go back you know, uh, anybody who's seen the Seven Up series, uh, which is an epic uh, a series done in uh, Britain, uh, started I think in 1963, but every seven years following a group of kids that uh, they started with back then, uh, uh, I would love to be able to track uh, some of the lives of these students we followed and some of the teachers. <laughs> Uh, so that's something that uh, we'll see w whether we can work out in the near future. Before we let Mark go, I'd like him to talk about the films that he's working on now. He's directing three films at the moment, and I'd like him to perhaps talk about those projects and sort of continuity that they represent. Well, first, you know, what you said yes, you know, yesterday, like, you know, slam the whole question of how do we, how do we break the cycle? Uh, Huge, huge question. Uh, and how do we get the potential uh, from so many people uh, that we're missing? I'm working on three films. One goes back to the DC jail, uh, where when I did Thug Life in DC, which was the film that kind of opened the DC jail, when we did Slam almost as we were finishing Thug Life in DC, um, there was a young man, Helene Flowers, you can Google him, uh, he was a supporting character in that documentary. We stayed in touch with him. He was 16 when I met him. Uh, and uh, over the years, he published, self-published from prison, um, 10 books of poetry, philosophy, um, a memoir. Uh, he was sentenced to life uh, for a murder that happened. He was part of a crew, but he wasn't there, but he was still sentenced to life. Um, and he became also a uh, criminal justice activist, uh, especially focusing on juvenile crime. And I don't know if you're aware, but uh, the juvenile justice system has changed somewhat, and that's why he is now free after 22 years, and we're doing this film, uh, because uh, you know there were some uh, juvenile ju uh, sentenced to death in, in Florida. Uh, the case went to the Supreme Court, and the whole neuroscience argument was given that, you know, uh, someone 16 years old is not yet fully developed and uh, it's not right, it's cruel and unusual punishment and uh, the Supreme Court actually went along with that except for one vote, Clarence Thomas. Uh, but uh, so the laws uh, change and after 20 years, uh, Halim was allowed to have his case uh, reviewed. He got out after 22 years, came up to visit us at our studio, uh, and announced that he was now a world-renowned artist and painter. And last fall, had a one-man show at the National Arts Club. Uh, in, in a week, he's going to have his first fashion show uh, as part of Fashion Week in New York City. So we're doing a documentary, that's one, called Halim, Super Predator to Superhero. Uh, that, that is an inspiring story. I'm also doing a documentary uh, called It's Basic on um, a anti-poverty experiment uh, around the country, in cities around the country, over 80 cities now, where uh, working uh, families uh, below a certain income level are getting $500 to $1,000 a month, no strings attached. Uh, to see how that impacts people's lives, uh, especially people living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, and uh, that is a fascinating story. We're in five cities, uh, St. Paul, Cambridge, Newark, uh, Gainesville, New Orleans, and Los Angeles, following participants in that over a year to see how this impacts their life. Uh, and then the final one I'm doing is uh, on the Oklahoma City bombing. I did a film 
uh, for NBC back in 1996 called Oklahoma City one year later, which focused on the survivors and the families of victims. Uh, and we stayed in touch with a number of those people. And now the, the idea here is to look back through the lens of what's happening now. Uh, and unfortunately, as I'm sure you're all aware, from January 6th to just what happened at Mar-a-Lago, uh, you know, a week and a half ago, uh, you see the threats of political violence and domestic terrorism escalating every day. Uh, and people even on the newscast saying, you know, are we headed for another Oklahoma City uh, bombing tragedy? And what really inspired us to do this project is the fact that most uh, young people don't know anything about the Oklahoma City bomb, uh, which is kind of shocking. In fact, in my own studio, I asked uh, some of the young people that work with us, and they knew almost nothing about it. Timothy McVeigh, did you ever hear him? No, who was he? Uh, so somehow, obviously 9-11 happened, that eclipsed everything, but somehow we lost focus on what remains the worst act of domestic terrorism by American uh, in the United States history. Uh, 168 people were killed on April 19, 1995. So we're revisiting that story, uh, but through the lens of what's going on now. So that's a little of uh, what's happening in our uh, little studio blowback productions back in NYC. <laughs> I hope you'll agree, we've had many guests over the years, honorees, and I would consider it a privilege for us to have Mark Levin join us and to present two just spectacular films. Um, and if you'd like to talk more with him, he'll be around all the way through closing night. Uh, and could we just give him one more round of applause? For doing this?